it's a very great pleasure to be here in Luxembourg. It's the first time, and it's a beautiful city, even in this weather. And unfortunately, we did not take the long walk this morning. Um, but uh, coming from Sweden and this year from Paris, I'm, I'm used to rain and in Sweden we have snow and many mi minus degrees, so a um, little, little rain doesn't scare me off. Uh, anyway, um, it's, it's, a, it's nice to be able to speak to you because I know people are very active in Luxembourg on, on, different, uh, on different frontiers. Uh, and of course, the, the topic of inequality as such is, is a is a hot topic in both the academic and the policy spheres since some years and it's not only because there is that's a, a kind of a fad but actually there is something fundamental that people care about I think which, uh, which, which is also very for me motivating my research on these issues um, so I know it's a it's a short we, have, we don't have much time and I also apologize for, for just presenting to you some of the research that we are doing, we, with, with, a, with a very big we, you know, meaning me, uh, but also <coughs> other people around. Uh, I will give you a very biased account of, of this uh, research and, and pointing to some of the topics and some of the results that I think uh, are, are very imp interesting. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, as a researcher, I, I always want to say that, but we, we need more, more efforts and more money, of course, to do more research and no, get, get to know more. So uh, uh, that's, of course, something to, to be clear about. Anyway, so the points of departure. There are some questions that I think are important. Um, f f uh, so for example, the first one here on this slide, why care about the rich? So in fact, let's only go 10 years back in time, or perhaps 10, 15 years. This question was, was quite uh, common. Uh, when, when I started writing about top incomes in Sweden, um, some of the old people working on inequality just responded like, why do we care about the rich? You know, you know our focus is on the poor, um, and the social dimensions of inequality, the rich, you know, I mean, there are very few, so they don't matter. And uh, as it turns out, I mean, I, of course, this is, is, is a warranted uh, crit criticism, you can say, about uh, this kind of, of research. However, uh, it, as it turns out, the rich do matter in many ways. They, they actually uh, command quite a great share of the resources that we have in society, both when we look at wealth in society, but also when we look at income. The rich or the top, top of the distribution uh, represents the, the, the largest share of the taxpayers in society. So they have a large stake. They are important to, to the welfare states. Uh, we need to know who they are and in, in how they respond to changes in the economy, not least the institutional changes that come about when we do tax reforms and so on. Uh, looking at the rich, uh, to some extent also allows us to have better analysis of long-run trends because the rich have always been interesting for, 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 for the government when it comes to taxation, for example. So the rich have been carefully tracked in the official statistics historically, uh, whereas the poor have not typically not even paid taxes for, for until the, up until the post-war era. So um, the rich are interesting as, as like a scientific meter of... Uh, uh, inequality over longer time periods. When it comes to the focus on the rich, uh, I will, I will, and what do we know about them? I will try to show you some of the recent results in these research literatures where I am uh, partly engaged. So I will show you what we know today and perhaps also give some hints to what we do not know and what, where we need to know more. Uh, one issue is also of course how uh, how do we how do we uh, analyze changes in society and what are the causes of changes of inequality and especially the, the the relative position of the rich what is the role of market driven processes especially like processes like such as globalization or technological change there is a great liter uh, large literature on on how for example, some of the 
technological developments are promoting the efficiency of, of certain groups in society, for example, the skilled people. Uh, is that important? <coughs> then there are also other questions uh, or uh, potential factors relating then to institutions, institutional change, political and economic institutions. Especially here, uh, tax changes, the tax system, and the redis redistribution that comes with that. We could also think about the role of uh, regulation, liberalization, opening up of capital accounts. And of course, is there a role for, for policy here? Here I will be much, much more uh, careful because it's, it's of, of course, it's my pleasure as a, as a researcher to not always take the really hard conclusions of my research. I let the others do that. But anyway, so three main points that I want you to, to, to think about, perhaps take with you. There is no single type of rich people. That's one of the main results that came out from this literature. It's a large heterogeneity within the top, re regardless of whether you look at income or wealth. And this is uh, an important result considering that only 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and in fact still today, many, many reports on, on income distribution, when they want to map the difference between the top and the bottom, they look at, the, they, they look at people uh, in the, at the earning, uh, earning an income at the 90th percentile. So when you row up the income distribution from, say, the, the whole population uh, and scale them up in, uh, in shares of, one of hundredths, then at the 90th percentile, you have a, a level of income. And that is compared then, for example, to median in income. And that's a very common measure of, of kind of skewness in the distribution. And as a measure of, of the rich and, and, the, and the rest, so to say. However, this literature has shown that it's a great difference between the 90th percentile income earner and the 95th percentile income earner, or the 99th percentile. So we, I guess most of you have heard about the top income share, or the top 1%. In fact, even within the top 1%, we have large differences. And these differences matter not only for our understanding of what's happening, but also, in fact, for greater measures of, of, of uh, inequality, such as the Gini coefficient. Another main point is income and wealth differs. And it actually matters how we measure inequality. This matter, and this is an ongoing discussion, actually it, almost a debate among uh, economists right now looking at the trends in inequality. So most of us are agree that income inequality has increased over, over the last three or four decades in, in, a, in a secular way. Uh, we, the, differences, the changes are different across countries, but they're there more or less. When it, comes to, when it comes to wealth inequality, those trends are much less similar. And this is puzzling. And uh, I will show you a little bit about these recent results and uh, where we stand today. But anyway, the b bottom line is that it can actually be a difference here that one needs to take into account. And I'm also more and more taking side with people emphasizing the role of institutions uh, for, for, to understand these patterns. I think that institutional change that, I mean, that we have seen in our countries over the last decades, uh, Reg regulations that have been changed, the so re-regulations or deregulations. We had liberalized very many, many markets uh, and opened up for, for, for cross-border capital flows, changes in tax systems and so on. They are very important to, the, to, to understand these, these mechanisms. And I think, in fact, many of the so-called market-driven processes, such as globalization, that's actually an institutional outcome. It's a choice variable, even. I mean, we can shut down globalization. And in fact, that the, fact, the, the observation that globalization is endogenous is, is something that we, we are currently also witnessing in terms of the, the, the discussions at the international agendas. So borders are perhaps being a little less uh, open. And this is therefore the role of polit poli political institutions, I think, is very important. OK. I will then, as, as I just said, I will just like wrap up some of the research results on, on the on the, on the let look on, on top incomes, look at, we will also look at then the new research on wealth concentration, wealth inequality, and also then about the determinants. Okay, top incomes. So this is a picture that some of you may have seen. What does it show? Well, it shows a long run trend in the share of all income that goes to the 
10% in the, the top 10% in the population, the top decile. So every, each year, this is for the US between 1920 and, and 2006, so each year all income earners are ranked and then we look at how many, how much income are, is earned by the, 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 the highest tenth in the distribution and we com compare that with all income. And as you can see, this is not a stable picture or a stable uh, share, it, it, it changes a lot. In the beginning of the 20th century, before World War, in the interwar era, so the top DSL earned between 40 and 50 percent of all income. And then there was a very large drop coming in, in the, after the Great Depression and also with World War II, uh, changing a lot of uh, the, the playing field, but especially when it comes to income taxation. And then it was a very stable period until the 1980s when the share of, of, of income going to this top group has increased steadily. And actually today, uh, having, having reached, and, and I must say I think 2013 figures show that they are even higher than what we heard, what was seen as the top in the early 20s. So this is just one way of understanding long-run trends in, in income inequality. Uh, the other point that I mentioned, the heterogeneity within the top, is, is, is seen when we, dis when we dissect uh, the top decile into three groups. The bottom half of all income earners in the top decile, then the next four percentiles, and then the top one percent. So we have three groups within this top ten percent. And look at the, then what, that, what, what that gives. <coughs> so the two bottom group, you can say, the bottom half and the, the next four percentiles, they're almost flat over this era. And almost all of this U-shaped pattern is within the top percent. But the incomes are so large so they sh that they shape the entire in share of the top decile. And in fact, they sh uh, I don't show it here, but they also shape the entire Gini coefficient. So it's, it's, it's there, there are, there are, these are big income sums that have an effect on our uh, of, of overall inequality. But also this makes very clear the point that we cannot just have the individual in the bottom of this group, the P P90 person, as the significant income earner of the rich. Obviously there is something that we miss here. And this is one of the main results of the recent years of research on, 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 on the top, on the super rich, namely that they are not a homo homogeneous group. So this is for US, for the US, I'm getting uh, a little, I mean, increasingly hesitant of, of, about always sharing, looking at, or showing the US results. I mean, the US is very important, of course, but some, uh, I was in a presentation a few weeks ago and, and the speaker, he was in Norwegian, he said that this is re actually really crazy because US is a very special country. We cannot generalize from the US in almost any respect. So why do we always have to show the US. I mean, now for us academics, it's clear because many of the you know uh, incentives to publish in US journals are are very strong. So what, therefore, we also cater towards the US. But I so I kind of apologize a little bit, but but by showing this. But still, um, and uh, but to, you know, but you know, as a comfort, there, there are two Frenchmen behind this figure. figure so <laughs> so anyway, but th when you look at Sweden, it doesn't. I didn't uh, have the exact same graph, but it's basically the same. So this is the top decile share for Sweden. You can see a, a, a fall over the 20th century and a somewhat of an, uh, of an increase uh, in the later part, but not as steep as in the US. This is for the top decile, once again. And when you, disp when you split that up, and uh, you, you see that the top percentile has basically the same shape, whereas those bottom two groups of the decile has, are, uh, shows on a relatively flat income share of the 20th century. So the basic point here also is that this pattern is fairly stable. It's actually remarkably stable across countries. And this was not known until 10 years ago, or 5, 10, 15 years ago. But the, 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 the top of the income distribution, the rich, income rich, also differ in other sense, senses. Yeah, well, uh, just let me refer, first show you that this is the trends, what we know about more than uh, just this uh, for Sweden and, and France. In fact, uh, Sweden and the US. In fact, we have data for 20, 25 countries now 
uh, on, on almost century long top income shares. And here is the top 1%. And what, what is the main result here is in fact that this fall that we saw uh, for US and Sweden uh, in the, over the 20th century is actually seen in almost any of the industrialized economies. It's a very uniform devel development. And I, I will not say very much more about this than that we have factors such as then the geopolitical shocks with the wars, but most of all we have the, the extension of uh, educational attainment, uh, which has been then democratized during the 20th century. We also have the increased role of, the, of government and re redistribution that also shapes this. I will talk a little bit more about that. But we also see here that there is some difference in the latter part. For example, the green line here, France, has not experienced a very sharp increase or in fact, it's not clear at all uh, in, the, in the share of the, to the top 1%. Whereas in the US, in the UK, and to some extent actually Sweden, there is a, a clear increase in this share. So not only is there a, a, simil there a similarity across these countries over time, but also we have differences, especially over, over, the, last year, over the last years. So another point, of part, you know, result in this literature is how, where does this, these incomes come from? Well, this is a dissection of the top 0.1 percentile in the U.S., where it shows the share of the top, in, top, share, top income coming from earnings, and the, that, that comes from capital. And these, this darker bottom uh, field is, this area is the, l the wages and salaries, the earnings then, the labor earnings, whereas the others are uh, the business income and then the capital income. No, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, well, yeah, of course, yes, one of the main points. So this is, yeah, sorry, so this is capital, of course. And, this is, and the white was business, that was at least right. And then there's earnings. So the main result here, of course, for, for the US is that there has been a shift in the top where incomes before came from capital with, with coupon clippers being predominant in the top and has now been replaced by high paid employees. <coughs> could be CEOs, could be managers. And it's, it's a very clear pattern. But it's, it's actually not a uniform pattern for all countries. So looking at four countries for which we have such long run series, we see that the share of capital income in the top, we have the, the dark line which is the top percentile and then the white uh, circles are, are the rest of the top decile. We see that the importance of, of capital in, in this group is different across these countries. So it's a little bit scattered, but you can see that for all countries we, we see uh, that we have data from uh, before World War II and after. We see large drops in the, sh in the import of capital uh, in this group. This is for France, you can see it for Sweden, and here's for the US. But then for the US, uh, the role of capital continued to decrease, whereas in France it has become slightly more important and also in Sweden. So, <coughs> so and of course, then relating uh, the factors that drive inequality, now we need to look at both labor market mechanisms and also capital market mechanisms. And they differ, ac differ across countries. So lumping together these countries is not a good idea to, to this extent. F making just the case for Sweden, here is how <coughs> I, uh, we, c we could then look at the top percentile incomes. I call them the rich here. Uh, Basically, half of it comes from capital and half comes from labor. Looking at the rest of the, of the top decile, about a tenth comes from capital. And for the, for the big part in the, in the population, basically everything is earnings or wages and salaries. But th this, this, this is a very interesting uh, uh, you know, difference across these countries. And also, of course, there, there are differences in, in you know, the regula regulatory environments that may, may have actually very large impact on these patterns. So, uh, and this is good for us because it makes it easier to make these links. Okay, <clears throat> so just in this very brief summary of, of, of top, the top income literature, uh, we see that there has been increase, an increase in 19, since 1980 in many places, but not everywhere. Uh, we see that uh, the top, very top of the distribution seems to be driving this to a large extent. And 
in the in the Anglo-Saxon world, it has to. It's, it's clear that you know wa salaries to to high-paid em employees mm -hmm. seem to be crucial for this trend, whereas elsewhere, rising capital incomes are more important. Okay. Wealth. So go to talking about super rich. I think many people think more about wealth. Uh, wealth uh, distribution is something that is not as well covered than income distribution. In fact, it's, it's something that has not been analyzed almost at all by economists or uh, statisticians for that matter. Uh, and it's for, ve for, for several reasons. So in fact, we don't have wealth data for so many countries. So the data I just showed you was largely based on, on tax, tax data, tax returns. Not, not all of them, some of them are survey based, but most of them are tax based. Wealth taxes are not that common, whereas income taxes exist everywhere. So for few countries we have data we, about the wealth distribution in a, in, a, in a credible way. Of course there are other, other, some other sources, I will just mention it very briefly soon. Wealth is another, it's another, another problem is also, or another reason is that wealth is more difficult to measure than income. So we, we have differences in valuation uh, when it comes to the tax assessment, uh, but we also typically want a market-based value. Um, to have that, we need market prices, for example, of houses, of stocks, uh, it, which is very difficult to get, at least at, uh, in, f over time. And uh, we're looking at surveys, that is often used for income distribution analysis. When it comes to wealth, surveys with s relatively small samples become relatively problematic because wealth is much more concentrated. So just to give you a sense, the top decile income share that I just showed you has landed around 30% in many of the industrialized economies. In, in, uh, and when it comes to wealth, that share is like is about 60% or 70%. So looking at all net wealth, 70, 60 to 70% of it is held by the top D side. And the bottom half owes nothing, basically. And then there is, the rest is held by the, the middle class, you can say. So if you have a small sample, and uh, it becomes very sensitive if you p pick people from the very top. If you just pick a few, uh, they could either you know, over, you know, explode the share of the rich uh, and become, they become too important. But if you, do, if you miss them, you will under, uh, under measure them. And this is one thing that is being very discussed very heavily when it comes to this new household uh, survey of the, of, of the ECB, as some of you may know, which has surveyed the wealth distributions and income distributions across the EU members. Anyway, these are some of the reasons why wealth, we know much less about wealth inequality and, and therefore also much less about the super rich in a, in a distributional context. Another problem, now I'm, now I'm very research typical, I mean, all we, all started by listing problems. I mean, underselling my, my results that I'm about to show you. But I, I think it's very important that you understand that here, wealth measurement is much more difficult and wealth inequality numbers are actually much less reliable than income inequality measurement. So just to give you a sense, pensions, pension assets are, is a very problematic uh, asset class when it comes to wealth. So some of them are funded, uh, defined contribution pensions, uh, uh, typically occupational schemes that could also be part of the public scheme. Uh, but they are typically uh, not, uh, they're not always part of the wealth survey. So they're not asked about, people don't know about them. In fact, some of them are tied into the systems and only accessed after, you know, when you retire. So they're not fully equivalent to your other kinds of wealth. So we have also the unfunded pensions, which are not there at all, but in just like as, as, a, as a promise, like the defined benefit systems. Um, but, you know, and, uh, and they are typically not at all in the, in the conven conventional wealth definition. But, uh, as some person pointed out to me, that you know, the claim, the pension claim, uh, pension asset claim in the unfunded system could in some countries be much more tangible than, for example, a Greek government bond, so, uh, which is typically in the, uh, in, the, in the balance sheet. So it's a matter of uh, perspective when it comes to that. And these are, of course, huge assets. Unlisted business equity is another problem. Uh, it's typically not part of administrative systems. Uh, now I'm talking then about the balance sheets of, of, of small firms. 
offshore wealth, I will talk more about this, and this is something that you, I think, many people think about living in this country, or at least working in this country. Yeah, I guess two, two thirds of you are, are statistically not living here, uh, as I understand it. Um, anyways, I will, I will talk a little bit about that. So, of course, just to, to recapitulate, uh, to, to, to make my case a little bit, I mean, of course, wealth is still very important. So we need to know about wealth. Uh, it's, it's important to, in terms like, it could be an insurance buffer for people, a toehold for making startups, it could you know, matter for power. It matters for income inequality. So you saw the numbers for capital income. They are, of course, directly related to, to wealth shares. And also important for equity. So much of the recent, so, so there are some recent papers showing that inherited wealth is actually not a constant share of all wealth. It has also changed, and it seems to have increased. And many of the, you know, um, of, of the models or the, the framework for understanding inequality is is reliant on, on whether people make their own situ status. So if people are self-made, or if we have a close relationship to the effort uh, of people, or whether there is like a luck component, such as an inheritance. And this has also great importance for, for, for optimal tax analysis. So many of the classical results in optimal capital taxation has said that capital should not be taxed very much at all because it's basically savings. Uh, savings can be related to people working hard and save much. But if it's inherited wealth, then there is a completely different conclusion. And therefore, uh, we, and we need to know about the wealth distribution. We need to know about how much of it is that is inherited and so on. OK. So what do we know? This is a quite ugly graph. I'm, I apologize. I wanted to show you a little bit similar uh, trend picture as we saw for, for income inequality. And here is for, for, for basically the countries for which we have at least some idea of the wealth inequality or the wealth concentration. So this shows. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually the top 1% uh, top share of all wealth over almost the entire 20th century for these countries. And I mean, there are many striking facts here. One striking fact is that the top percent owned basically half of everything uh, in the, in a century ago. It's, I mean, in the, in, in the UK, they may have even owned as much as 70% of all wealth. This is top 1%. It gives you a sense of the degree of, of inequality in terms of wealth. And now I'm, uh, but we see then for most of these countries, for basically all of these countries, a, a similar compression or equalization over the 20th century. I can give you references in, in where we, the, for, on papers that look on the reasons for this, but uh, they are to some extent the same, but it has to do with institutional development. And the last period, uh, since the 1980s, there's much less of an increase here. Uh, looking at the US, we have numbers from the survey of consumer finances. In fact, it's, it's basically flat over the last decades. And this has been puzzling. It's, it's flat for, basically for, for almost all countries here. And uh, people are very puzzled and some are provoked by this. How can that be? So is it a mismeasurement problem? Is it because of evasion? All the wealth is in Luxembourg. Or, um, or is it because of uh, the, some other part of the dynamic which we, uh, we don't understand? Once again, I want to uh, I, we want to look a little bit at the, at the U.S. because uh, there's a, there's an interesting debate right now about the wealth distribution or the West and, and the recent trends in the U.S. So this figure, this line here, uh, is then one source of wealth that you can look at. Another, and this figure takes this. This is, a, this is the same black um, uh, estimates from the survey of consumer finances. But here, it's a paper by Wojtek Kupchak at the Columbia University, where he compares that to uh, a, this blue line. This is for the top 1% and this is top 0.1%, where the share, wealth share is computed from estate records. So the, the, the probate inventory reports that people set, when, are set up for people who die. So you, you make a balance sheet, and, 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 and then we can see how much wealth did pe people have when they died. And we can, we can try to look at the mortality rates and, and have a, uh, an equivalent for the living population. So here you see a, a, a sharp fall in the 30s, but then basically a very flat trend in the 80s and, uh, and, and 90s. Nothing happening. 
And then uh, the shock came uh, last year, two years ago, when, when uh, uh, two Frenchmen used income tax returns, the capital income, and then they backed up wealth from that. So say that you have $1,000 in, in capital income, so in inter interest earnings. And then you say that, OK, this may be a 5% interest rate. That can re then, then that refers to a, a $20,000 stock or some bank deposits maybe. So they do that and then they find that there is a very sharp increase si since the early 80s, which goes counter a a a at least uh, to a large extent to the survey evidence here and also the estate evidence here. So this is an in ongoing discussion and uh, there will be more papers on this. There are actually now papers coming out on some European countries on, on the capitalization method and uh, discuss some, some of those problems that, that are inherent in that method. But um, th this is unfortunately not a clear result. More of a sense for you to know that this is s a place where we actually want to think more and work more. And right now we, are, we don't know enough. But we know that there may have may happened something or not. We, we, we need to know more. But of course, offshore wealth is a particular topic which has been also uh, getting increased attention over the last years. It's very difficult to measure, it has a, but it has, of course, a great uh, relevance in terms of the, uh, its, its link to uh, the tax system and our ability to fund our welfare states. So especially from Sweden, uh, with our great ambitions on, on, on redistribution, um, we need to be able to, to tax capital. But if, if, if there are large flows to offshore uh, or like tax havens, then we have problems. And one, one estimate showed that at least 8% of all financial wealth in the world was placed in tax ha havens, and, and illicitly so. So it's not like... And um, I just want to show you a little bit about this and also especially on the effect of uh, one, one example on how we can think about it in, in, in the terms of the distribution and how it affects the wealth distribution that, that we have seen. Uh, this is a paper by Gabriel Zygman on, on uh, <laughs> comparing wealth uh, in, the, in, the, in the disclosed books and, and in the non-disclosed books. So it's, it's basically showing when we compare how many assets uh, that are out there and openly reported and, all, and, all, and with the liabilities. And it shows that some countries have a lot of more uh, liabilities than, 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 than there are assets, meaning that uh, to, to, to that country, meaning that there is kind of uh, claims out there which are not reported openly to people's home countries. And as you can see, the top here is uh, this country, this wonderful country, and maybe it's an accident, but uh, it has a content if you, if you look at the second, you know, Cayman Islands. Ireland, and then of course France, Netherlands, Japan, Italy, US, Switzerland, so Guernsey. Uh, there's, there is clearly uh, a, a scale here, uh, or, a, or a magnitude when it comes to wealth in, in tax havens. And, and uh, there is, we need to know about this in terms of a fiscal, then the fiscal needs of, 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 of jurisdictions, but also of the, in terms of our distribution analysis. Uh, Here's, a, here's an example of how, how this could affect uh, the wealth distribution. I, I, I did a study on Sweden where we, of course, have th thought about these, these things. And in fact, one of the reasons for why we have had so much, had to have so little wealth research in Sweden is that it's precisely that uh, people don't re re rely on the, on the wealth data because they think that, you know, all the rich have placed their money in, in, in the tax havens. So, so looking at Sweden, we took the official statistics and made three additions. So we tried to use the um, residuals in the balance of payments, uh, looking at the net errors and emissions, uh, that could then be related to ship, uh, shipments going out of, uh, out of Sweden, but all the payments did not come back. Basically, some of the money stayed abroad. So we don't know exactly where. But we thought, we, we, we thought that if one accumulates that over time, does it, you know, is it kind of just oscillating around some zero or is it systematically showing us something about that money is systematically le left outside of Sweden? Then we looked at the journalistic super, uh, super rich listings 
I think you have them in Switzerland. Is it Bilon? Uh, yeah, Bilon in Switzerland. Does it, you, you have them here in Luxembourg? It's like a sub, super rich list. But you know about them. The f there's like these Forbes billionaire listings and so on. So we looked at these and see, <coughs> okay, could they, ha does it have any bearing? Is it just like tiny amounts or, or, or is it important? And we, we just added them to, to, the, to the people in the top. So here is what, 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 what we show for, from the balance of payments residual. So we could see in 1989 in Sweden, uh, we, had a, we had a liberalization of our capital account. So capital flows were made much more easy and much, uh, were basically free. Uh, this is he around here. And after that, so before that we had a very, some small amount uh, and then in 89 we started seeing indications of, of some outflow. We could see, but then, uh, and then in, in the 90s that became larger and then in, in the 2000 uh, you know, it's, it stayed but at, at a fairly large level like 10%, 10-15% of, of GDP. We could see a similar pattern for Norway, for Finland. For the US it was the other way around but still relatively small amounts. Then, then I, we also do this for some other countries for where, for example, Switzerland where we could expect potentially another, uh, another effect. So this is Switzerland. So at least it says something that there is a systematic uh, you know, relationship in these uh, statistics that at least could indicate uh, offshore wealth of, of, of households which, which are, are, are there. So we're, we, then we have used this estimate as an ind indicator for the tax driven or potentially tax driven capital flight. So what happens then? So here is the official series for, for the top wealth share, top wealth 1% uh, that I also showed you before. So it went down very uh, strongly uh, during the post-war era and it stopped around 1970s and then has been fairly flat. So what we when, when we add the, the sum of wealth to the top coming from the balance of payments uh, omissions, we have this. We have an increase in the, in the uh, top wealth share. So then we also looked at the super rich in Sweden. Many of them hold companies in non-listed, sh uh, in, in, uh, hold shares in non-listed companies, meaning that they are not fully accounted for in the official wealth statistics. So this is one of the problems that I started out mentioning. So if you add their wealth, and because many of them, and they are rich, listed as billionaires or very rich, those obviously will be on the very top. So, so then you have an even a higher, uh, a degree of, of uh, increase in the wealth concentration. And then we also have some Swedes abroad, people living typically in Switzerland or in London, some in New York. Uh, and we can discuss whether they are Swedes uh, or like should be belong to the Swedish uh, pop population. I mean, that's a matter of the, you know, perspective, I guess. So uh, then you have that. So now we have went from a top share of 20% for the top percentile in Sweden, and uh, if we do very extreme, this is like we, when we had the Ingvar Kamprad, uh, the IKEA founder in, in living in uh, Switzerland. Uh, but not only him, actually. There are like uh, Tetra Pak founder, founding family, and some others. And H&M uh, H &M guy uh, is actually in here. So uh, they actually have the list of stocks. Anyway, you should see that this top wealth share is almost... If at 40%. It's, 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 it's radical. And I, I, it's, it's, this is almost surely wrong. But it gives you an indication that this has distributional consequences. But then perhaps people say, oh, well, this, this is true for every, every country. Well, we did it for, for, uh, for the US too. And it's basically, we, did all, we, did the, we added the BOP emissions, the super rich home and abroad. It basically does not change at all. So potentially this indicates. Uh, the relationship between domestic taxa taxation in especially high tax countries as, as Sweden and, uh, and the, 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 the offshore capital flight. So uh, can policy mitigate this capital flight? Yes, um, I need to speed up a little. But, uh, there is a discussion now, as some of you maybe f are following, uh, that the information treaties that are increasingly being, being uh, struck between tax havens and other countries, they can change things. And some people say that 2017, 2018 be, be, will be very important here, uh, at, at least for, the, for personal wealth holders. Uh, the, there is some in, in, evidence. Here is a paper by, by Zuckman and Johannesson 
showing that there is a, a decrease in the number of new bank accounts being, uh, being opened in response to these information treaties in, in the past. And the newer ones that come out can be even more powerful. So potentially, the tax havens will respond to this. Uh, maybe some of you actually uh, can tell me more about this. But this is something that where we can have a policy agenda. OK. Let me ve very, very quickly then just uh, open up uh, this, uh, and a bit the discussion on, on determinants. So as I start, I've already mentioned this, that we talked about, we typically talk about market-driven forces. We can have technical change, globalization, but also the institutional forces. This point is, is very important to stress. So all of social science has, has great difficulties in, in establishing causal effects because there are so many things happening at the same time. So it, it's very difficult to understand how, how, how things are mattering. But I, I will give you two examples. Taxation, and especially taxing the, the income top, and financial deregulation. So this is a picture of, again, the US uh, looking at the top tax rate at, in the margin, so the mo top ta marginal tax rate and the income growth among the, the top percent, uh, top perc one percent, and the rest of the of the of the U.S. population. And this picture shows a, a fairly large effect on on. Uh, um, it showed basically that when top marginal taxes were, were very high, income growth in the top was relatively low, whereas it was kind of smoothly uh, increasing in the in the lower part of the, of the distribution, where they, they where they, they they did not pay those highest taxes. But then when these taxes were cut radically in the 80s, uh, we see an increase in the top income uh, growth. And just showing uh, as a, 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 very, a very brief uh, recapitulation here that there seems to be a response uh, uh, to, these to these tax changes in the, top, in the income top. We can see that where top marginal tax rates were, were changed the most or, or redu reduced the most, we also see the highest income uh, growth uh, across countries. So uh, this gives us like a sensitivity or elasticity of 0.5, which is relatively much. However, uh, in this discussion of, of how people respond in the top to tax changes, we can think we can also now start to think about there are efficient responses that people basically work less. They put in less effort. And that's actually a negative response for, for society because typically these people are talented and you know, we want them to work hard because they contribute. So th those kinds of crowding out effects are negative. But we could also have avoidance and income shifting effects. So basically that people delay their uh, realizations of capital gains or time it so that it becomes uh, taxably uh, <coughs> optimal. We could have uh, or perhaps moving reporting basically there instead, instead of earnings they report it as, as capital income if they have differential uh, tax rates on that. So th th those kinds of responses are actually not very positive. We want to get rid of those and potentially the, the overall response we could also have a compensation bargaining here so say, basically saying that if, if we tax people very much, they don't care very much about increasing their income because most of it is taxed away anyway. So, but if we have very low marginal taxes, people get, become much more active in getting higher income. And, and, and at least this is a theory and a potential idea of what is driving these things. And I think this response is economically very relevant, whereas these two responses are not so important. And maybe uh, we, the discussion now comes how important are the responses, uh, how much should we tax the top capital earners, uh, co top income earners. Okay, the financial deregulation. Uh, there's a new, study, a new study where we look at how the, the very drastic deregulations of uh, the financial markets in the, in, in the UK in the 80s, it was a, the, UK, the London Big Bang as it's called, and also in Japan in the late 90s, both aimed at revitalizing the financial sectors. Did they affect top income shares? And if so, how? So we do a, a, a comparison between those countries, uh, the top income shares in those countries and other countries, try, and trying to hold everything basically constant. And, and we find that the effects are really visible. We see that top income shares do increase in the years following these deregulations. So this is for the UK. 
So this is the, the, the solid line is the UK top uh, share, and the, the, the dotted line is basically the comparison groups. And we see that uh, after the Big Bang, there was a divergence, and, uh, and uh, we interpret that as the effect, the deregulation had an effect on top income shares. Looking at Japan, we see a similar pattern. Uh, the years after the deregulation, we see a divergence in the top shares in Japan versus those other countries, uh, where basic, basically we, 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 we try to hold a uh, level of, of financial development and, and, and deregulation constant. Okay, final slide. I'm just repeating myself. Uh, the rich are very heterogeneous. Uh, when, we, when we talk about inequality, we should differentiate between income and wealth and, and actually account for the fact that they actually do differ. And, and, and also political factors seem to be key or institutional matter, matters seem to be key. Okay, thank you very much.